Shut it. Which song or tune? Apache. Apache, yes. Which year? 1960. Um, which means I was why I was slightly surprised they should use that as a, a thing with teens in 2012. But very successful, a bit of a leaking through to Facebook, predominantly a TV campaign. The next stage was to link it to Tom Syndicate. Anybody here heard of Tom Syndicate? No, I haven't before I researched this campaign either. Very much involved in youth. Um, something like 2 million Facebook and Twitter followers. Now, is he influential or does he provide opportunity to see? We can come back to that issue. But all of a sudden, creating a game where people had to suggest a method of eating Madison's fridge raiders whilst playing a game and people coming up with hats that would feed them and all sorts of things, interactive crowdsource gaming. Having a look at how we can impact it. And this is what I mean by the difference between counting and measuring. So on the left hand side we have counting. So the Facebook went from zero to 127,000. They will never again be able to get such a clean reading because this was the first time they had done their Facebook campaign and so <clears throat> we went from zero to something. Next time, when you go from something to something else, it's much harder to know how much of it is to do with the next campaign, how much is still residual from the, from the old campaign, how many of those likes are fully engaged. Uh, a click-through rate of 0.6 versus the average of 0.04%, which is kind of really sad. Um, viewed three million times on YouTube, lots and lots of metrics and numbers. And certainly you should, when you're running a campaign, set some predictions. You should say, I think we're going to get this. This is the target. These are the numbers. So these are compliance statistics. Did we achieve what we set out to achieve? These are the measurements. So after allowing for all other sales drivers, the sales that can be attributed to social media campaign rose by 20%. So we need to know what the sales data is if we're going to do this sort of measurement. That's a, a fact I'm going to come back to few times. The return on investment was £2.44 for every pound invested and that this was better than any of the other things they were doing at that time um, and approximately 40% more efficient than TV. Doesn't mean it was more effective than TV. Efficient means a better ratio. Effective means how much stuff did you get. So we look at both of those but these are the measurements. Did it move sales? Did it move it forward in a really good way? And then we have this measurement. So those are the top two that allowed it to be qualified as peer-reviewed case study. Then we have, okay, during the period that everything was going on, we see that heard of rose from 61% to 66%. Um, consideration went from 1% to 3%. Now these are the sort of long-term measures that market research can add into the picture. So they're not the activation events, they're not the immediate sales events, they are the things that contribute to brand equity. However, we can't say they were entirely due to the social campaign. So we should absolutely recognize them, we should flag them up, but we can't overclaim them because just because they were happening at the same time. One of the things we'll come back to is that as humans, we are incredibly programmed to believe that if A follows B, A was likely to be caused by B. We're just hardwired that way. It's part of our Bayesian thinking. So, for, so often, it is not true in this sort of element. So, question to the room. Which of the things on this page should or could be generated by market research? You now have to shout out answers. That's how this game works. Thoughts? Consideration. Consideration. That's a classic mark. I mean, how else are you going to get that other than market research? I mean, that is a, a really classic, that's a survey question. That is so much in our wheelhouse um, as to be beyond discussion. What else is there? Heard of. Heard of, absolutely. Um, more interesting, perhaps, is how we measure these things. Because some companies in this room, um, and we have seen the here from Mohawk, absolutely are in that space. Lots of market research companies are not in that space. And we really do not want to be competing in this space because most of that information is free. Um, there's not a lot of money in trying to compete with 
people are offering stuff that's really accurate and free. What information would we need to answer these questions? Lots of sales data, um, and we would need it pretty granularly, one of the things we're going to come back. You're going to want to know this stuff weekly, at least, maybe better. So we're going to want to know that. What else are we going to want to know? Media Yeah, what happened? What stuff was sent out? And I mentioned this slightly earlier as well. What else are we going to need to know? We're going to need to know sales. We want to measure that. We have to have the sales data. One of the challenges, and we had a great workshop in here with um, Clear uh, from Saatchi earlier, is that frequently the insight department actually themselves don't have access to the sales data. So these are one of the things that we need to change inside these organizations. <clears throat> what is social media? Well, it's a bit like art, isn't it? It's really hard to define, but it's really easy when you see it to say, yeah, that's social media. So Facebook, Twitter, yes. TV, print media, outdoor, direct mail, not at the moment um, social media, although people doing advertising out of home are trying to make it more social, certainly. Three key factors. It had to be interactive and social. It had to be digital. Um, the, the latest book from, um, from Keller points out that word of mouth is massively important and 10% of it is digital. 90% um, is people talking to people, um, but we can, we're focusing on the digital aspect and it's got to be attributable media. So we've got to know who saw what and therefore be able to follow it through. And we recognise that it's got lots and lots of other roles in the organisation besides marketing. So it's transactional, creational, it's used as a research tool as we heard at the conference yesterday. Okay, the POEM framework, very important. <laughs> what is paid. Would you shout out some paid things for me? What about paid media? Yes. TV, radio. TV, radio. Anything else? <coughs> Facebook ads. Facebook ads. Absolutely. <coughs> so we do have paid in the social space. Uh, social space. AdWords, paid advertising in social networks, direct mail, radio, print, all of this is paid media. You pay for something and then it's delivered and you're going to pay for clicks or you're going to pay for impressions or whatever. Owned media. So Starbucks owns the My Starbucks Idea site, that's part of their media. Your house magazine is owned media. Um, your Facebook page is owned media. You don't necessarily pay to put things in your own media, but it costs money because you've got to do the artwork, you've got to do the management, you've got to do the design work, you've got to do the maintenance, you've got to pay for the bandwidth, and so on. And then we get earned. Earned is sort of the, what we thought was going to be the holy grail at one stage, which is the shares, replies, reviews, favorites, uploads, retweets, spontaneous blogs, all of that side of the media. Now, essentially, that is harder to measure, really, than this, because paid advertising is the easiest to measure. Your owned media ought to be straightforward to measure, although if it's something like a magazine, you just come back to the traditional problems of opportunity to see, etc., etc. But earned, you've got to find out where it's going on. Where is all this earned stuff actually happening? And there's a massive interaction. All, just about all, good social media communications are based on interactions with other channels and other forms. So we have all these paid things going on here, word of mouth and net organic search or natural search, owned media, earned media and sales and they're all interacting backwards and forwards. What we discovered by looking at the evidence talking reviewing the cases reviewing all the best papers that we could find in the area is that pay is much more important and earned is much less important and i summarize this really as you pretty much get what you pay for you know, that's how markets work if something was much cheaper and much better we would all start doing it and it would either stop being as good or it would become more expensive 
So the market sorts out these things by and large. Yes, you can point to a TV campaign that overperformed. Yes, you can point to a social media campaign that overperformed. But in general, the performance is incredibly linked to the expenditure. And the expenditure is the paid element within that. So if you are get one of those campaigns where you didn't spend a lot and you get a fantastic reward, don't think you're likely to do it again. Just be really happy that you did it. So here's an example of some of the difficulties going on. Um, who's seen this poster in, in London? Yeah, okay. Some people, of course, more likely to notice it than others, Darren, because they're interested in the topic. <laughs> so paid and home advertising. And the theory is that that would generate earn because people are going to be tweeting their empty pint and this is other people are going to notice it and that will generate sales. Undoubtedly, that will have happened. But actually, that ad, you're walking up to the pub, and you think, ah, am I going to have a lager? Am I going to have bigger? You see that, you think, yeah, I'll have one of those. It's going to generate direct sales. The direct sales are going to generate word of mouth and earned activity. So we have these loops going on. One of these phrases that you're going to hear more and more over the next few years, endogeneity. Essentially, it's feedback loops. You can't necessarily say A causes B or B causes A. What you have to say is that A causes B and B causes A to some extent. And so we're seeing this as a growing phenomenon and one of the challenges that we need to recognize. It's always been there, but we've oversimplified in the past. So I want you to have a quick um, think about social media campaigns that you can think of and how they've integrated. So who can Think of a social media campaign that's got all of these different elements of traditional and paid and so on. How about money supermarkets? Yep. With the bomb. I'll give you another start as well. The, the Dove campaigns, um, the cancer selfie, lots and lots of campaigns out there integrating the different channels. So what are the challenges of measuring social? Well, first of all, we start off, there are some similarities to what we already know. Paid advertising is like paid advertising, and we know a lot about measuring paid advertising. Earned media elements is probably more comparable with PR. Um, and let's not descend into paid advertising equivalent um, as a measure, oh, if you needed this PR cover, it would have to pay for it. It would cost you five million pounds. Um, but there is good PR measurement. Direct response of social is very much like direct marketing. Now, several of these are not traditionally covered by market researchers. No reason why they're not. They just have tended to be in other categories. So we see the direct uh, marketers. We see them using their chain analysis and their answer tree analysis. Um, and we need to be in those spaces too. Measuring calls to action, very similar to cleaning, very similar to point of sale. So we need to look at the similarities to what already exists. The overall impact on the brand needs to be assessed, and that is absolutely core market research territory. Um, what are the differences? The degree of measurability. It is much more, there are far more metrics, far more numbers coming out of social than in most other forms of communications. The social media research opportunities. We can find out not just how many people saw it, but what they said and what they felt about it and who they communicated this to. Um, more combinatorial than other platforms. We need to work out where the activity played within paid, owned and earned. And the earned, of course, is the difficult part of that. Yes, you know where the paid was. You should be able to work out where the owned was. But the earned is more tricky. When did the social activity take place? Um, do you remember the Cadbury's Gorilla ad? Fantastic ad. It was uploaded. It's been played millions and millions of times on social media. It is still being played on social media. It is still impacting the brand. We used to have a campaign. It ran from April the 1st until um, maybe May 31st, and that was the campaign before and after was a clearly delineated concept. With a social media campaign, they, can, they potentially run and run and run, and previous campaigns are still there running. 
So we have this additional complexity of knowing when is it actually happening. Real-time feedback, which I mentioned, causes people to change the campaign during the measurement period. Um, we often use it for tactical aims, so we need to know what is the objective it's seeking to do. It may just be to develop a mailing list. It may be to develop more people applying to work for your organization. So we need to know about those aspects of it. Quite often, research budgets are smaller. So some of the techniques we'd like to use, I'm going to talk about market mix modeling, may be quite difficult to justify if they cost three times as much as the budget for the campaign. Um, so fitting things to that is one of the challenges in this area. And there has historically been a, a lack of knowledge about best practices. So one of the reasons that we have undertaken this at the uh, IPA Social Works looked at it was to establish current thinking about good practice. Um, we're all a bit hesitant to use the term best practices. Um, best practices for something that's been done for 10 years or 20 years may be tenable. Talking about best practices in something that is still developing and is so dynamic is probably a little risky. What people usually mean is, my company does it this way, so it's called best practices. Or sometimes if it's a consultant, it means, I don't really know why we do this, I don't want to discuss it, so I will tell you it's best practices. Um, maybe I'm a little cynical. <coughs> One of the issues that we need to look at, because it's a very hot topic in social, is influence. The idea is that ideas and preferences spread through communities <coughs> socially, from person to person. Pretty much nobody disputes that element of that model. Two, some people are more influential than others in as much as others tend to follow their leads. So we, the 10% of Americans that influence everybody else was one of the <coughs> famous books in this area, Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point. Um, and then we get things like clout and cred. Influence can be measured. <coughs> and then we can target and utilize that influence. And marketing to influencers, also known as influencer marketing, is likely to be more effective if we only spend our marketing budgets on people who are likely to influence others, it's got to pay much greater dividends. However, there are some challenges. The first is the people that we want to measure are the people who were influenced. They're not people that we reached with our campaign. So that in itself is quite an interesting challenge. We've got people over here who are doing stuff who we didn't contact because they've been influenced by the people we contact. So that's one of the interesting challenges. There's a massive dispute about how influence works and whether it works. And if you look at most of the, the literature, it forms into two camps. The people who believe influence works apply common sense. The people who doubt that influence work apply data, experimentation, and science. So most people believe influence works because it just applies common sense as opposed to the data. Um, but there is some evidence, and I'll talk about it briefly. Um, the most important element is incrementality. What, what would you have got anyway? Is your campaign, your um, trial, your offer, your promotional campaign, getting you new people, or are they people you would have got anyway? And another word, which is the most important word really in this whole presentation, counterfactual. We have to know what would have happened if we'd not done this. Or we have to estimate what would have happened if we had not done this campaign. What is the counterfactual? And just to highlight um, influence, and to give my voice a brief rest, Ted, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> <laughs> the 
<laughs> and here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and the crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy who was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, the TED. Thanks. <laughs> so, hat tip for uh, Simeon for giving me the link to that specific video. Classic social media influencer would have picked the lone nut as the influencer. Probably at the next 20 um, conferences and, uh, sorry, shows and events that he goes to, he won't be followed. Because um, we see a pattern, we see him dancing and then we see a crowd dancing, we, oh that's influence. Um, so we really need to be very careful about that influence model. There is an alternative word, and this is another word that's coming into the lexicon increasingly, homophily. The fact that birds of a feather flock together, we do things that similar people do, and we respond to things in a similar way. And this is a thing that you need to, to have a look at that we, we can't spend a lot of time on today, but it has a really big impact. And there are lots of videos up on YouTube from Sign and Aral. I'd absolutely recommend them. Looking at how much of things are to do with influence and how much of them are to do with people being like people. And he highlights a New York Times front page which said, are your friends making you fat? Which applied causation, which is they found that Fat people have fat friends and thin people have thin friends. So let's apply some causality to that. The fact that your friends are fat is making you fat. Uh, he was saying, actually, no, the people you meet in the all you can eat buffet who are like you also have the same size as you. And the people you meet at the gym because you're working out all the time are more like you. So actually, we can't necessarily apply that causality to it. A lot of the time we need to think about homophily within that. What is the counterfactual? What would have happened if we hadn't done it? It has a massive effect on marketing strategy. So if we have a market which is 90% influence and 10% homophily, how would we market in that market? We would target the influencers. We would do promotions to the influencers. We would identify them through clout and cred and all these sort of various bits and say, that's how we do it. But if we have a market that we think is basically to do with tribes, and I was talking to um, a mobile phone company the other day, and they see it very much around tribes, then in fact, you would market to the people like the people who have already bought your product. Find the people who've already bought your product and market them. This is traditional segmentation, effectively. That is influencer marketing. So you spend your dollars, you spend your pounds on marketing differently depending on which of these two. It's not an academic difference. It's a real difference in terms of how you need to establish the campaign, and that's a measurement issue. Okay, let's see how many people smile at this. Um, I'm sure some of you see before. I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. <laughs> Sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. <laughs>
we've really got to get out of this habit. I mean, have you noticed? Most babies go to bed about six o'clock in the evening, and not long afterwards it gets dark. There is a clear cause and effect there. Um, the event that comes second is causing the event that comes first. Because nighttime is coming, you go to bed. But the temptation so often is to, to see that causality the other way around. It's very interesting in terms of, of big data because correlations allow you to predict the past. And if the future is a replication of the past, that's fine. Another campaign the same way is likely to behave the same way. Um, can I predict where you will be next week? For most of you, yes. You're probably going to be at your office, which means most of the year. Can I predict what you will eat next week? Probably yes. Can I predict what you will eat this evening? Much harder, because you're out of your pattern. We've broken those correlation links, so we need causation, because causation is what's required to predict the future. So if we're trying to establish how to do campaigns, how to do social media campaigns, we really need to establish causation within that link. How many of you have read or seen the video of the long and the short of it? If you put your hands up, so we've got, yeah, about 10, okay. As well as looking at all the IPA social works in the, some of them in the next week, you need to look this up in the next month or so, uh, or two. It's a fantastic study by the IPA looking at how advertising works, and it identifies that it's the long term that changes. And one of the phrases they use in there quite a lot is that the single best indicator of long-term benefit is price elasticity. If for the same price you can sell more stuff, that's great. Or you can sell the same amount of stuff for a higher price, that's great. That is real business. Um, and if we talk about a short-term effect, you could do a bog off, buy one, get one free, every week of the year. For the week you run that, you will see a sales jump. You will also see a downgrading of your long-term value. Every bog off you do gets, might bring in some trialists, but it erodes the brand value. It erodes the price you can sell in the long term. It erodes the value that people have intrinsically for that brand. So that's all about the long term. And as market researchers, we are the best people for measuring those long term effects. Short term and long term effects. So social is very, very good at those short term things. You get these immediate measures. Micro objectives. When you look at the objectives, you should have macro and micro. We want those activation events. Did they download? Did they play it? Did they try it? Uh, long term effects, we really, really need to make sure we're covering. Now, without short term effects, there aren't any long term effects because you pull the campaign. But the long term effect is not some of the short term effects. That's why we need to be measuring different things. That's why we measure things like attitude, belief, my type of brand, all of these sorts of issues. Here are the sorts of measures. Um, so you won't actually put your hand up, but how many of those do you feel comfortable using? Um, I think probably most people in here are pretty comfortable with branded advertising tracking. Um, and a few people will be comfortable with all of them. One of the things we're going to see going forward is much more multidisciplinary teams. Your research company doesn't do market mix modeling, you're going to work with somebody who does. If you can't supply branded ad tracking, then you're going to work with somebody who does. If you can't do social media research, you're going to work with somebody who does to make this integrated solution to evaluating things. Where does Qual fit in that picture? Qual's brilliant, but it's not a measurement technique and it shouldn't be used as a measurement technique. How many people bought something because they saw this ad? That's a quant question. Why did they buy it? I think that's a quant question. We need to make sure we use the techniques in those sort of ways. How does the ad work? Quant question. How many people saw the ad? Quant question. And we need to make sure that we don't confuse them. There's a lot of talk of the qual quant mix. I'm very happy for people to use both, but they actually have really different purposes within that process. Here's um, a little picture of the sort of complexity we're talking about. Uh, this is from <laughs> Bottom Line Analytics. So we've got some social media going on in there. You're not supposed to be able to read the numbers. You're supposed to say, well, that's a complicated picture, um, is pretty much the visual impact here. Over here, what we've got is earned 
media. Personal care engage in the social media volume. This is a personal care market. Up here, lots and lots of things collected via standard market research going into this picture. And then all of this stuff over here, which is install TV, print, radio, is collected by automated audit techniques. So we're bringing together audit techniques, we're bringing together social media related techniques, we're bringing together um, traditional market research techniques to produce an integrated model that says this is how these components are working and this is what their contribution is to that process. So the working group came up really with a five point plan for baking in, um, which I thought until this project was just a phrase used in North America, but it turns out we use it in the Marcom's world too. Um, baking the measurement in, so don't add it in afterwards. Five point plan. What is the campaign activity designed to do? So that's the starting point. Is it supposed to get more people applying to join us? Is it supposed to move the sales needle? We're gonna have macro objectives, like improving sales, and maybe micro objectives, like more people trying it. So we've got the scope for both. Why social? What is the role of social within that? What decisions will be made on the strength of the evaluation? Is it going to be afterwards we will decide whether it was a good thing and how we will do the next campaign? Or are we going to be using the measurements during the campaign to change spend, to change the activities? What are the appropriate data sets and metrics that we're going to be using and then how are we going to do that evaluation? One of the problems is that most of the people that I meet get asked to do the process here. That hasn't happened. Um, and so you're told, right, can you evaluate our campaign? And you desperately hope they haven't actually already started the campaign at this stage. Um, even if they have, get them to write down what are the objectives. It's a really good practice to get everybody to put down on a piece of paper, sit in an envelope, we're looking to do this, we think that we will achieve this. And now let's revisit those afterwards to see what the difference is in the outcome and the predictions. So. We need to, even if we start here, try to push back and find out, so why did you do social? And you'll find sometimes things like, well, everybody's doing social, but we feel we've got to be involved. We're not engaging with young people, so we did social. So hopefully, if we keep pushing, we will have better thinking going on at the top end of the process. Um, we cover <coughs> the metrics in the report a little bit, but it's a great book that we can refer to. So. Metrics come from the platforms, the Facebook, Twitter. They come from clients and partners that we're talking about, owned media. Third parties, Comscore, Cloud, Google, uh, market research companies, social media monitors. And you might be enlisting participants, so people are beginning to collect their own quantified self-information. All of this is data we can put into the process. This book here by Steve Rappaport, a friend of mine in the States, is probably the best thing 197 metrics with 12 fields describing each one and it is um, really quite an inexpensive book so I recommend that if you want to be able to look at what those metrics mean for the next 12 months. After that it'll be a little bit out of date and hopefully Steve will update it again. Brief taxonomy, we have how many followers and fans has the campaign attracted, has the people that were being involved in the campaign attracted, that's one of the types of metrics. Reach, how far did it go? How many people retweeted it and who was reached by that? Time spent. Now this is an interesting one because if your campaign is a video, you wanna know that people watched it to the end. If your campaign is supposed to be about really quick purchasing, time spent should be short. So time spent has, is very much linked to what the objectives of the campaign is and the delivery of the campaign. Volume, how much stuff was generated. It's not a particularly meaningful measure, but you do want to record it. Volume of retweets and volume of comments is interesting, but often it's covered in terms of engagement. How many people responded? What was the second order, third order, fourth order relationship of that? That's really where the um, engagement with the paid media, engagement with the owned media, and engagement with the earned media come into play. Sentiment analysis, we've not got time to cover the, um, the ills of it, but it's an essential part. If you want to understand what people are saying, but it isn't just positive and negative. It's things like on message, not on message is much closer. And of course, outcomes like sales. 
integration with other levels. So you need to measure what was the impact of social, and maybe it generated 500 units. You know, that could be hundreds of thousands of pounds, that could be hundreds of <coughs> sales, whatever. The total impact of the campaign, so we had TV, we had press, we had radio, was a thousand. And then we need to work out what the contribution of social was. And the contribution of social can be less than what we think it is when we just look at it on its own. Because actually we've got some double counting. We've got some people who saw the TV ad and they saw the social and they went on. And we're going to have to probably split some of that between the two of them if we can't identify the separate components with that. Here's a, a great example from my Mondelez and Cantor web panel of this. Are we working the other way? Only TV generated 1.11. Only Facebook generated 1.12. The expected combination of the two was pretty much the sum plus a, a little bit of rounding. In fact, it did much better. Synergy. When these things work well, they're better than the either of them are contributing. So that's one of the things we're looking for in the measurement. Here's another example from uh, Mindshare, thanks very much to those guys. And the top line is the really naive look. What's the correlation between TV and Twitter? And you say, oh, look how influential it is. People who are tweeting are much more likely to be watching it on TV. People who are watching it on TV are much more likely to be using Twitter. That's great. The dark bars are the causation element. Where did Twitter increase viewing? <clears throat> now, if you had sold people on those numbers, these numbers look pretty sad. Actually, these numbers are phenomenal. They're great. You just need to make sure that we have the expectations in the right place, and we're saying this is the unique contribution. This is the causal contribution of this element. So here is the, an example of that sort of thinking. In region A, in time period one, the sales were 100 units, and then we ran a TV campaign and the sales were 110 units. In time period three, we ran TV and Twitter, and the sales are 130. What has Twitter added to the picture? What is the contribution of Twitter? I want the obvious answer, please. 20. We would all say it's added 20. Unless we had designed our campaign, and this is a massively important point, design your campaign so you can measure them. Because in region B, we did Twitter in time period two, and we added TV in time period three. Now it looks like TV added 20. Actually, the synergy of TV and Twitter adds 20. And we can't, with just that data, split out which of the two it is. But this thinking that A follow B is so programmed into our heads that so many times we'll have done a test where we do first thing, and then we'll add another one, and we'll say what was the incremental value of adding it without thinking, what is the counterfactual? The counterfactual is we could have added them in the opposite order. We could have run them both initially from the beginning. So we need to be thinking about the counterfactual in terms of making these measurements. And then, of course, we throw up our hands in horror because we find out that another unit of the organization has been running a bog-up campaign in T2. So actually, that synergy may not be as good as we think it is. So the key market research steps um, make the case for measuring ROI is important. It's possible. Probably the single biggest thing from this project, the IPA Social Works project, is that it's possible to measure it. The second is that it's important. If we want to use it properly, if you want to justify spending money on social media, you actually need to measure it and develop the ROI. We need to understand the metrics. We are not going to supply, as market researchers, these metrics, but we need to be really comfortable working with them. Master the measurement. Now, that probably means collaboratively with other organisations. Bake that measurement in. Challenge those five points and say, well, what were the objectives? What were the macro objectives? What were the micro objectives? How are we going to use them? Make the case for accessing sales data. You cannot measure the ROI of most campaigns without sales data. If you've got a campaign that was how many new qualified applicants do we have applying for a job, yes, you could. But for the vast majority of campaigns, which is supposed to be in that granularity about how we use that richness of information, and we're quite a long way away from being there. You see some great examples of some people who have done it. But we can also learn from traditional planning. 
One of the things you will often see, and we've seen it in some of the presentations at this conference, is you get people who are using really old-fashioned technologies, like sitting with people and talking to them, with great new insights into behavioral um, economics, cognitive psychology, semiotics, and really thinking about people. And on the other side, we get a lot of people with some fantastic technology asking really dumb, stupid questions like, why did you do that? Do you think you will do this a lot more in the future? Um, and we've really got to marry that together and learn from the best of research and the best of planning when we use the new technologies. And one of the most critical things, and we're coming back to this in the presentation, is that the short term is not the, uh, the most important part of the picture. Social makes you really focus on the short term because you get responses instantly. You know, I run Facebook adverts for some of the things that I do and you look at the clicks and the click-through rate and which execution and you've got your A-B testing all going on and it's really exciting. But actually it's not telling you whether or not you're improving the position of your brand. How is brand equity changing? Is this going to make you successful next year against specific objectives? So here's one of those case studies from Madison's um, that's in there. You can go to the website, you can download it, looking at the Snap brand. And we start off by um, taking the whole context. It was launched in 2006, and in 2012, the sales were in decline. So they needed to do something, they wanted to re-energize it. Didn't start as social. Um, it started as, where can we sell more of this stuff? Okay. Create a boost for after-school snacking. 61%, let's say, about two-thirds of teenagers, when they come home from school, play computer games. In my day, we used to go out and play football, but now they'll come home and two-thirds are playing computer games. And two-thirds of those are eating snacks. No wonder we've got an obesity problem. But okay, let, let's tackle that by getting them eating our snack. So, um, I'm just looking around the room, and I thought that I was going to be the only person who could actually remember this band, but I can see a couple of people who might well be old enough. So here was the campaign in 